Hi, I'm Melissa Laird-Smith. Um, I recently joined the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the University of Louisville, and I'm really excited today to share with all of you uh, some newer data on leveraging smart sequencing to resolve complex immune loci, to thank the organizers for this invitation. So just to bring everyone up to speed uh, so that we're all speaking a common language, the immune response is a carefully coordinated multicellular and multi-organ cascade developed to detect anything that's non-self. So this includes uh, pathogens, parasites, uh, as well as what could be considered non-self cells such as cancer. Now, broadly, the immune system is divided into two arms, the innate and the adaptive arm. Innate immunity is quite rapid and it responds to generalized motifs that are called pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Um, these are are molecular patterns that are found in non-eukaryotic organisms. And these uh, mechanisms are carried out by the cells represented in the purple circle in that overlapping Venn diagram on the bottom left. The adaptive immune system arises much quick, uh, with some time after the innate response uh, is mounted and is much more specific. It has a very high accuracy to the specific pathogen of interest. The mechanisms of the adaptive immune system are carried out by B and T cells represented in the red then on the, on the left, on the right of the left-handed figure. Um, so it takes some time for this immune system um, arm to come up, uh, a few days to a few weeks after infection. But when it is available, it detects and targets a particular pathogens with ex exquisite specificity. So B and T cells, which make up the adaptive immune system, function to seek and destroy through any means possible. So what I'm just showing you here is an overview of how these cells function. B cells specifically produce antibodies, and it's the antibodies that are the effector molecules of that arm of the immune system. We don't need to go into great detail about all the different functions that antibodies can uh, perform in the context of the immune response, just to know that they are myriad um, and they are specialized. T cells also have a very specialized route of attack, and the T cell population can be divided very broadly into two classes, CD4 or helper T cells and CD8 or cytotoxic T cells. So they act directly or indirectly to clear non-self. So I'm showing you a schematic of, of CD8 T cell action here on the top right. Uh, these cells, uh, after recognizing uh, antigen very specifically, will release granzymes and perforin to directly destroy infected cells. CD4 cells, on the other hand, detect uh, antigen and then produce uh, helper molecules or signaling uh, assistance to spur other parts of the immune system. And these CD4 cells um, can be pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, or regulatory. But together, their antigen specificity allows us to um, clear pretty much anything that comes to our system. Now, how is that possible? I mean, we, we can't predict uh, what pathogens we'll encounter in our lifetime. And so uh, genomically, our system is built in a way to create the level of variation that makes it possible for us to detect anything we may encounter. So overall, it's done with incredibly complex genomics. That's sort of the, the, the cut to the cut to the cheese of it message. The long story of that is this is done through the expression of multiple haplotypes, extensive recombination mechanisms, and selective uh, hypermutation as necessary. So in the case of B cells and, and honestly T cell receptors as well, this variation is, is introduced through the recombination of specific V, D, and J segments at these immune loci. For any of you that have had immune classes, immunology classes in the past, that can bring back a, a few flashbacks. It's quite a complex system. We don't need to understand it uh, thoroughly today, but the idea is that uh, any one of the uh, up to 100 B segments can recombine with any one of the many D segments and then any one of the J segments to create a BDJ a re recombined fragment that then encodes the variable region that detects uh, the pathogen of interest. The fact that there are many, many segments in each of these pools creates a combinatorial diversity uh, that produces that level of variation needed to, to detect anything that we may see um, upon infection. Furthermore, in B cells, there's an additional mechanism of somatic hypermutation that um, happens after the B cell has detected an antigen that increases the affinity and, avidity and affinity uh, for these antibodies uh, to the antigen of interest. T cells, on the other hand, sort of have a, a, a two-part system in order to detect the specificity of an antigen. There is the T cell receptor, which, as I mentioned previously, acts similar to the B cell receptor, generating combinatorial diversity through BDJ recombination. But the T cell receptor only detects pathogens uh, when they are bound to the uh, human leukocyte antigen molecule, or HLA. So you have the opportunity of diversity on both sides, both at the T cell side as well as the host side that's expressing HLA. Now, HLA 
is a multi-gene a region of the genome uh, divided into class one, class two, and class three genes. Uh, they're represented on that bar graph on the right. And each one of these genes has uh, hundreds, if not thousands of alleles that have been characterized um, in the populations around the world. And so there's this incredible amount of haplotic, haplotic diversity that provides an additional level of variation when combined with the highly variable T-cell receptors. So the difference is here is that B-cells generate diversity on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. Every B-cell undergoes BDJ recombination, and every BDJ recombination event that happens is uh, assumed to be slightly different. HLA itself is fixed to a diverse array of haplotypes, uh, but the diversity of those haplotypes and the combinatorial diversity of those haplotypes uh, is incredible given the number of alleles that we know exist. And then when you combine that with the fact that these HLA molecules have to interact with the T-cell receptors, you get a very high level of diversity. I'm going to pause for a moment with sort of the immunology background and talk about single molecule real-time sequencing. So the, uh, the, the direct impact of single molecule real-time sequencing is the long reads that are capable of being generated by their specific polymerase. Um, and, and what happens when you generate a, a smart uh, library is that you take a double-stranded DNA molecule, you ligate on smart adapters, which are essentially hairpins. And what that does is change your linear sequence template into a circular template for sequencing. The polymerase, as I mentioned, is incredibly processive and, and capable of generating very long read lengths. So when you have a fixed insert of a specific size of your double-stranded DNA molecule, but a very processive polymerase, what happens is that polymerase goes around and around and around the molecule um, in order to create multiple passes over both the forward and the reverse strands. Once that is done, we can use those forward and reverse strands to collapse into a highly accurate con circular consensus sequence or high fidelity or high fi read. And it's these reads that are used for downstream analysis. So the, um, the reason that we use these reads for the immune loci is that these reads can both generate uh, sequences over long molecules as well as incredibly high, accurate, uh, high accuracy. So in the case of immunoglobulin heavy chain locus, so this is a critical component of the antibody, um, we can use these long reads to assemble a highly accurate but large region of the genome. So this genome uh, genomic region is about one megabase. And in, in the instance that I'm going to show you today, we use the custom target enrichment method that uses uh, 8KB overlapping fragments to assemble this locus with high accuracy and able to generate distinct haplotypes in each individual. The reason that the long reads are so powerful here is that this is a region full of structural variants. And when you use short reads, uh, they don't capture the entirety of the structural variant within a short read and therefore cannot accurately map. When you use these larger reads uh, generated by smart sequencing with the high accuracy that's produced by the hi-fi reads, you get a very clear picture of where insertions and deletions lie. In fact, if you look at the assembled haplotype in line two in that figure, you can see a, a set of black boxes in the middle of that haplotype. That represents a deletion in that individual that's not seen in the parallel individuals in this figure. And that was able to be captured by a single molecule read and firmly mapped to that region of the locus. In the case of HLA, which I'll talk about today, the, the genes themselves range from three to about seven KB. We can capture them, the entirety of the gene in a single hi-fi read. So no assembly required, no bioinformatic computation, and we can get highly accurate resolution of the full sequence, um, introns and axons in a single read. So I'm gonna to start today by talking about HLA. Um, luckily, there is a commercially available robust workflow for the full length resolution of HLA alleles uh, without imputation. So let's start a little bit with background why HLA is important. As I mentioned, HLA and T cell receptors interact to activate and modulate the T cell response. Specifically, uh, class one is expressed in most nucleated cells and it presents antigens to CD8 positive T cells. With the appropriate secondary signaling, the HLA class one and T cell receptor interaction on CD8 T cells uh, triggers that cytotoxic T cell activity to clear non-self directly. In the case of class two, these molecules interact with T cell receptors on that CD4 T cell population. Class two is expressed only on what are considered professional antigen presenting cells, macrophage, dendritic cells, and B cells, and they present antigens to T cell receptors on CD4 positive T cells. Appropriate signaling uh, within the context of this interaction triggers those helper responses, production of cytokines uh, or um, B cell help. So classifying and characterizing these HLA haplotypes 
in individuals is very important for understanding the progression of disease. It's been shown in several disease models that particular haplotypes of HLA can offer either a protective or even in some cases a detrimental effect on your ability to mount an effective T cell response. So understanding the HLA haplotypes expressed in, in individuals that pre, uh, pre, present a, a diversity of responses to in response to infections like COVID is critically important for understanding what role T cell responses and HLA restriction are imposing uh, on the ability to actually clear these types of infections. So the company GenDX actually provides a commercially available proprietary HLA amplification protocol and really amazing downstream informatics tools to analyze this, providing sort of an end-to-end -end workflow from sample through analysis of HLA haplotyping. This original workflow was designed for short read sequencing on Illumina instrumentation, so we've adapted it to work with the PacBio systems. So when we get these kits, um, and the workflows, we, we do not use any of the library prep reagents that come from GenDX. We use the PacBio Smart Bell kits. Uh, but we do use the, the primers in order to analyze uh, and amplify the specific HLA genes of interest. Now, uh, GenDX has primers available that can amplify up to 12 different HLA loci, uh, which is great. And often you have to buy these in separate primer uh, sets and actually amplify genes one by one. What's been really great is in the past few years, they've started developing multiplex amplicon pools. And in this case, in the data I'll show you today, we use the pool called MX61. This uh, amplifies six different HLA loci highlighted here in the pink square, uh, specifically three class uh, um, one alleles, HLA A, B, and C, and three class two alleles, DRB1, DQB1, and DPB1. But it does it in a single PCR reaction, limiting the, uh, the use or overuse of precious patient samples. So our workflow looks like this. We use a 250 nanograms of genomic DNA. Uh, this has to be high quality. It can't be formalin fixed tissue or formalin fixed DNA. Uh, we put this into the MX61 GenDX PCR reaction, again, that amplifies six loci in a single PCR. Once those amplicons are amplified, we generate uh, smart bell libraries in the PacBio library prep. We do this using barcoded smart bells. So that hairpin adapter that you ligate onto your double-stranded DNA molecule, in this case, contains a, a unique barcode that separates multiple um, individuals into one pool. So in our case, we've been doing 48 plex reactions. Um, each one of these 48 plex pools is sequenced on one smart cell on the SQL system um, using the smart cell 1M. Once the data is generated, we demultiplex this data and generate those highly accurate hi-fi reads. And we have a resultant FASTA file that we use for downstream analysis in the NGS engine software provided by GenDX. So HLA is typed at uh, multiple different levels. Um, sort of a eight-digit eight identification gets us the highest resolution uh, definition of what that HLA allele looks like. And using these highly accurate single molecule reads, uh, which phases the entire molecule into a, sing in into a single read, allows us the highest resolution data for these HLA alleles per individual. So what I'm showing you there is sort of the, the take home message of a haplotyping on a, on a patient sample where you get eight digit resolution of both alleles across all six loci using that NGS engine software with those high fi reads. So as I mentioned, we use 200 to 250 total genomic DNA input for that amplification. Um, we get out of that amplification about 100 nanograms per microliter of amplified material per sample. This obviously varies widely per sample and patient. And about 150 nanograms of that amplified product will be used as input into the library prep. This is what these libraries look like. This is a bioanalyzer trace using the 12K DNA chip. The amplification itself is incredibly robust. The libraries are very consistent and can easily be pooled without being worried about differential molarity. Um, we do this uh, pooling manually at this point, although our hope is to eventually automate it. Um, and then we sequence on the, on the smart cell on the, on the SQL system. So this is just some raw data from one of these runs. And really the point I want to make is in the graph on the far right. So in this graph on the y-axis, you have what's called base density. So this is the number of bases that are found in each read length bin. And across the x-axis, you have that read length binning. And what I want to uh, point out to you are the, the two areas of the curve that are shaded by the two darker blue colors. This marks the 50% mark, or N50, where 50% of the bases lie in reads of a certain length or above. So 50% of our bases in this, in this run lie in reads of over 170 kb, which means if you have a 5 kb 
uh, insert and you get 170 KB read that's gone around and around and around that 5 KB insert, you're getting uh, many, many, many tens, if not hundreds of passes of your molecule to generate the most highly accurate reads for downstream analysis. So as I mentioned, we demux barcodes, generate those HiFi reads and put them into NGS Engine. NGS Engine is an incredibly powerful software. Um, it provides an, a number of different critical criteria as you're analyzing your data, including the mappability of the data, the overall read lengths of your molecules, the depth per locus, which is somewhat skewed due to amplification bias that GenDX manages within their amplification schema, and then the actual genotypes and haplotypes uh, of, the, of the samples you're looking at. Um, you'll notice I just want to highlight two particular points. So the mappability, the far left column, is in that uh, parentheses, the percentage of reads that map to your locus. With our HiFi reads, we routinely see between 95% and 100% of the reads mapping to the locus. That's an incredibly high, high, high mappability. In fact, as comparable Illumina data is in the, in the high 80s to low 90s. So these HiFi reads are outperforming uh, sort of the standard uh, pipeline that GenDX itself re recommends. Moreover, you can take these data and generate a PDF report, which is a great way to organize your data, and it includes an incredible amount of information. So it includes the allylic calls that are made, as you can see here in this screenshot of page one, as, any, as well as any um, alternate fields that could be uh, possible in your data, given the ambiguity of some of the higher resolution reads um, due to database issues uh, with the HLA population. Um, it also shows you the, the sort of signal to noise ratio of your reads and the mappability um, on the locus of interest, as well as the SNP variation across that locus um, for all six alleles. And most importantly, it gives you, again, the mappability, the number of reads that map to your locus. So again, we're getting you know, between 95 and 100% read mappability, which is, which is incredible. So overall, using the GenDX um, molecular reagents and software combined with the power of the long read sequencing, we're able to do very robust, a high throughput HLA typing with the highest resolution technologies possible. Um, this has been incredible for uh, COVID studies lately, as well as, as applicable to any, um, any studies where you think cat, uh, characterizing the HLA restriction of your disease of interest would be, would be useful. So the next thing I want to talk about quickly is, is, a, is a genotyping strategy that I've been working on with my colleague here at the University of Louisville, Dr. Corey Watson, to develop a sort of a parallel to HLA genotyping, but in this case for the immunoglobulin loci. So again, uh, these are the loci that control the recombination and encoding of our B cell receptors or antibodies um, as, as part of the B cell response. So the genomic complexity at the IGH locus is extensive and it's poorly characterized. So we know, again, that these regions are generated through recombination of variable, um, the VDJ region to create that variable region. We just don't know what the population variation of these genes are. Um, there are only two references in the database. I'm showing you a, a schematized version of the first reference here, and I'm gonna layer on top the second reference. And what you can see is that with only these two references, there's a huge amount of diversity. So across these two references, uh, we were able to see that, or Corey was able to see that over 50% of IGH sequence falls within a large segmental duplication. Copy number variants are highly prevalent. Um, and again, they've only been sequenced twice. And neither of these samples are actually a full a viable diploid human individual. And so it really is thought that many genes are not represented in the current assemblies. Now, earlier genomics methods such as GWAS study, GWA studies have really limited the utility of assessing the role of IGH in, in disease progression due to the fact that so, so little information is known about the locus. So what I'm showing in this schema is um, the microarray mapping of oligos across all 23 human chromosomes. And what you can see is that the HLA region, which we just spoke of, there's many, many variants that are known to be in that locus. And in fact, uh, over 9,000 SNPs are represented in some of these immune arrays. So the arrays are ready to capture variation associated with disease in this locus. Even the cure region, which is responsible for NK cell uh, recognition and, and, and activity, which is also thought to be somewhat of a black box in the genome. Um, in these types of immune arrays, over 800 SNPs are represented. Whereas if you look at IGH, there are only five. So if you think about the data that I just showed you, between just those two haplotypes, just those two references, we observed over 2,500 SNPs. So if there are only five SNPs represented in arrays, then you're going to really lose the ability to associate variants in this locus with disease when they're performed with these large GWAS studies that came sort of 
in the generation before application next generation sequencing. But we know that that allelic diversity is there. A lot of investigators in this space use immune profiling, sequencing the B cell receptors to extrapolate and impute what the, what the germline uh, variation of these VDJ genes are. And we see that both there are a number, a vast number of alleles in each of these genes, somewhat like the HLA parallel I spoke of before, as well um, as possible new alleles that haven't been discovered or recorded in the database. So overall, the motivation of this project was to understand the true extent of population diversity and see if we could build out an assay that could measure that in any sample. You know, we firmly believe that the lack of data in this locus has a huge impact on any disease association studies, a development of diagnostic and therapeutic strategies that depend on an antibody response for their efficacy, as well as functional studies, um, again, that depend on antibodies for their efficacy. So the aims of this project were first to expand the reference database such that we could incorporate ethnically diverse haplotypes into the design of our genotyping assay. And then that is aim two, to develop a genotyping assay to be utilized sort of a la the HLA assay I just showed you, to investigate the impact of, HLA, of IGH allelic diversity and correlate that as a function of disease, um, disease progression and vaccine efficacy. So the first thing we did again, aim one, was to, to generate some additional haplotypes. The two references that are in the database are both Caucasian derived. So we also wanted to include an ethnically diverse array of samples uh, to see how the variation of these locusts differ amongst populations worldwide. And so we did this using a number of samples that have been well characterized uh, in the Thousand Genomes Project and have had previously a FOSMID libraries generated uh, uh, from them in the Evan Eichler lab. And so we, we did this, we sequenced these FOSMID libraries specifically across the IGH locus. So in this case, we took these phosmids, which are about 40 KB, we sheared them and generated smart bell libraries. These were sequenced on the RS2. This, this project has been happening since about 2016. So the system was a bit older. And then we used that data to tile across and build out these haplotypic references for IGH. So this is a schematic of just the V genes within that immunoglobulin heavy chain locus. These are the two references I showed you earlier, schematized in a linear fashion. So just to give you a little bit of a groundwork, um, each one of these boxes represents a distinct V gene. The color of the box represents the number of alleles in that gene in this individual. So what you can see even between the two references is that there are pretty big drastic differences, both in the, the copy number variants at each V gene allele, but also in more gross structural variants like deletions. So in the HG19 reference on the bottom, you have that deletion on the far right end that doesn't exist in HG38, and the other deletions are shifted around the locus. So we added six additional references. So we, we more than tripled the number of references that are available. Um, and these references were generated from samples uh, uh, sourced from Yoruban populations in Africa, um, both a Chinese and a Japanese sample from Asia, as well as two additional European samples. And again, you can see a vast amount of variation, both in the allelic diversity represented by the colors of the boxes in the vertical rows of the same gene placement position, as well as in these gross large structural variants. The European samples and our two uh, references include that large deletion in the middle of the locus, whereas the African and Asian samples don't include that deletion at all. And that's uh, quite interesting. If we're trying to generate uh, vaccines targeting uh, specific alleles, we need to make sure that those alleles are present in our populations of interest. What's also notable are the yellow squares. So the yellow squares are novel IGH alleles that haven't been seen in the database before. So when these um, assemblies were completed, we were able to submit to IMGT, the um, immunogenetics database, a number of new alleles that had not been previously observed, as well as characterize a huge number of unique SNPs to each, um, to each of these new references that could be uh, variants affecting expression of, of downstream antibodies. So using these data together, we designed a novel capture panel to act as a genotyping assay so that we could actually apply this method and characterize the IGH genotypes in any sample that you happen to have. So in this case, we're generating uh, six to eight PB uh, genomic DNA fragments. We're capturing them with an IGH specific oligo pool and then generating a pet biosequencing library and, and sequencing them, assembling them into unique haplotypes. And when we do that, here are two examples. Um, we can actually generate phased haplotypic resolution of the IGH, so that entire one megabase region, we can separate out the maternal and paternal allele, as well as the genes that vary between them 
um, for, uh, for analysis. So these are two, again, thousand genome sample that we used to benchmark. This paper actually just got accepted in Frontiers uh, of Immunology about two weeks ago, so we're quite excited to get this out in the field. Um, we also benchmarked, uh, so these, these, these thousand genome samples, because there's so much Illumina data that have been generated with them, we were able to benchmark on that Illumina data the performance of our assay, uh, as well as, as a lot of Sanger sequencing data as well. And when you do that level of benchmarking, and you look at the comparison to ground truth, uh, which was the Sanger sequencing, we see that we get fall, far fewer false positives and false negatives of variants called with our tool, which is called iGenotyper, which is a custom analytics tool to take this capture data and call these haplotypes in the IGH locus than you do when you use um, some of the, the existing Illumina imputation um, software. The SNPs that were identified between the 1000 Genomes Project and iGenotyper using the short versus long reads uh, vary. There are some overlaps, but some of them are also very neat. So the implication of these data is, is pretty tremendous. Um, you know, we don't, again, we don't know a lot about this locus across populations. So even just understanding population genomics at that level is new and interesting. But the power of it here is whereas people have been imputing uh, allele usage and in, 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 in genotypes from RNA data, this assay actually captures all of it at the DNA level. So it captures the coding regions of those V, B, and J genes, but it also captures the intergenic regions, which actually contain very critical signal sequences, which can impact the ability to express these genes in the form of an antibody response. So we are now set up to do uh, and, and are performing now matched DNA and RNA experiments where we genotype an individual, we do their immune repertoire sequencing and look and see how these two things are influenced. And if there are variants in the DNA that are affecting our ability to express particular antibodies, uh, which could be critical for evaluating the efficacy of a vaccine. So in conclusion, uh, we firmly believe that resolution of complex immune loci is significantly improved when you utilize long single molecule sequencing approaches. Full-length genes can act accurately be captured as single molecules, which negates any need for bioinformatics uh, imputation or reconstruction. Assembly of longer region is greatly enhanced by the ability to phase haplotypic SNPs across much longer molecules uh, when they're assembled. And long reads capture the full structural variants in their surrounding context, which helps avoid mismapping and allowing the resolution of copy number variants, which may be captured uh, within a single molecule or large insertions and deletions which in which um, reads that are generated with smaller read technologies may not be able to accurately map. End-to-end -end HLA genotyping uh, uh, pipelines are available. Um, and when you combine those with long reads, it creates a, a robust commercially available um, mid to high throughput end-to-end -end solution on the SQL systems. We're quite excited to increase our throughput on the SQL 2 um, system that was just, uh, that we just purchased here in Louisville. And we are developing novel IGH genotyping strategies uh, with custom analytics support in the form of the iGenotyper software, which will allow for the interrogation of full locus variation in any sample of interest. Now, I really like to end, uh, end my talks with sort of a take home message. Um, and uh, uh, at a meeting last year, I was, I was challenged to create a sort of a seven word challenge. So can you summarize your talk in seven words that the listeners can take home with you? So my seven word challenge for this talk is that long reads resolve the complexity of underlying disease etiology. So um, I'm going to wrap it up by uh, acknowledging and thanking ex extensively my collaborators. As I mentioned, I recently joined the University of Louisville only within the last uh, month or so. I'm very excited to work side by side with Corey Watson, who I've been working with to do the IGH work thus far. Um, and we are uh, very excited and proud new owners of a SQL 2 system and, and will be enrolling in the Certified Service Provider Program with PacBio shortly. Um, and so if you're interested at all in exploring either of these options, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much.